Welcome to Discover Bible Prophecies. Have you ever tried to understand the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation and come away confused? The Discover Bible Prophecy series is designed to give you an easy to understand and follow explanation of the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation. The visual format has been especially created for today's smartphones and tablets. And we try to keep the studies under 60 minutes with plenty of Bible references for you to double check what we've presented to you. Here is a sampling of the videos that are available for you to view. The Rapture and Daniel 9 series has been very well received with thousands of people enjoying and getting a blessing, blessing from it. Have you ever wondered about the tabernacle in the desert? Well, the tabernacle series explains all the spiritual significance of the tabernacle and all the furniture in each of the apartments. We've just recently released the Day of the Lord series. And we have broken down the Day of the Lord and the Great Tribulation into 10 steps. And this series is, is gaining much popularity. So these series, along with many other Bible teachings, are available for you to download. There are four easy ways that you can view these videos. The first one is for your smartphones or tablets. If you have an Apple uh, iPod or iPhone, you can go to the Apple Store and for $1.99 you can download this application called the Bible Prophecy Revealed application and you can view these videos on your devices anytime you want. If you have an Android device, smartphone or tablet, you can go to the Amazon application store for Android and for $1.99 you can also download the same application for your Android operating system. So we looked at the Apple and the Android systems. You can also go to your iTunes uh, and download this free program where you can subscribe to the podcast called Bible Prophecy Revealed. It's a free podcast and you can view these podcasts on your uh, uh, personal computer or your Apple computers. You can also go to YouTube. We have a channel there called The Coming Crisis and we upload all our videos there and you can view those anytime you wish. And finally, if you have a general purpose podcast software on your device or on your computer, you can search for Bible Prophecy Revealed and subscribe to our podcast. So these are four easy ways that you can use to view these uh, videos. All right, let's get into our study today. Today I have entitled our study, The Full Cup. And we can read in uh, Psalm 75, verse 8, where the Lord says, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, 
and the wine is red, and it is fully mixed, and he, that's God, pours it out. Surely its dredges shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink. So we will be studying the full cup principle, as I call it today. As you know, this series is covering the great tribulation that's coming about on earth in very few uh, days. So I wanted to include this study uh, right after the, uh, the four trumpets are released, right after step two here is kind of where I'm doing this. So this, today we'll be covering this special topic called the full cup. And as I've just mentioned, we are focusing today primarily on the Great Tribulation period of 1,335 days, and we're going to try and answer the question, why? Why is God's wrath being released on planet Earth during this time? So in order to understand the why of God's wrath, we will need to explore a concept called the full cup principle. And we'll be covering that primarily today. So let's begin. Well, right after the first four trumpet judgments, there'll be carnage all over the earth. So let's quickly review what happens during these first four trumpets. First, let's look at the timing of them. When will these trumpets occur? Well, I have a study on this, and, and I'll show it to you here in a second. But the first thing that will happen in sequence will be the fourth seal on the Book of Life will be opened. And when that is opened, God will release the seven angels and they'll be given seven trumpets to sound. And as soon as they're given these trumpets, God will tell them to wait. So they'll be waiting for something to happen. And what that will be, will be the 144,000 of God's messengers. God will select them and seal them. So the seal will be opened. The angels will be given their trumpets. The angels will be told to wait until the 144,000 are sealed. Then God will declare, there will be no more delay. The trumpets will sound. And what will happen after that? The censer from the heavenly uh, temple will be cast down. Coals from the censer, in, in the censer from the heavenly temple, will be cast down onto the earth. And when these coals are cast down, this will signal, or this will initiate, the first four trumpets being released. Now I have a complete study on this whole topic here. And that study is found in step one of the 144,000. So if you haven't had a chance to view that, I would recommend you view that full study to get all the details of why and how this happens. But today we're going to find out why, after the sensor is cast down, why these first four trumpet judgments, why they are released on earth, and why is God doing this. So let's just quickly review what the first four trumpets are. The first trumpet, number one, will be meteorites hitting the earth, causing widespread fires. Trumpet number two will be a giant asteroid that hits an ocean, causing a gigantic tsunami, overturning sinking ships, and killing many a marine life. Trumpet number three will be an asteroid that hits a landmass contaminating the drinking water. Many people will die 
from drinking the contaminated water. And number four, there'll be worldwide darkness that covers one third of the earth. And this darkness will result from volcano, volcanoes erupting, spewing their soot and smoke into the sky. So these are the first four trumpet judgments. So what will happen after these judgments are released? The Bible says that 25% of the population on earth will die as a result of the first four trumpet judgments. Well, with our population today at 7 billion on earth and growing, 25% of that would be 1,750,000,000 people will be dead as a direct cause of the first four trumpet judgments. You know, we read in 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. So how can a God of love cause so much carnage? So why would God, a God of love, do this to us? This is going to be the question that will be on everyone's mind. Why? We will be searching for the answer to why. When God releases his trumpet judgments on earth, it will be difficult to explain the why of these judgments. You know, how will people rec reconcile that God is love when they see smoldering evidence of his wrath lying all around? This is unimaginable carnage that we'll see on this earth. How will people reconcile that God is love with what they see with their own eyes? So let's, to, to explain this, let's go back to the beginning of time a little bit and take a look at the sin situation from God's perspective, how he planned on dealing with sin. So from eternity past, God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, before they created any life, before Jesus created life on earth, God the Father wrote the book of life, and then he sealed it with seven seals. And those seals were sealed through all these many thousands of years. They've just started to be opened. So God wrote his, his, his plan on how to deal with sin, and he documented that plan in the book of life. God created Adam and Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden. And by and by, they sinned. And because of their sin, Eden was lost and they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. Well, the Bible speaks of 6,000 years. It has several different references to that. And if we look at the, the Garden of Eden, it was created in seven days. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sabbath, where God rested. And God has used the seven-day template uh, several times in the Bible. And I believe that he's using the same template to let sin run its course on earth. He's given sin 6,000 years to run its course in the 7,000th year, the millennium, God's uh, chosen people, God's saints, will spend a thousand years in heaven with him. So God more or less gave earth 6,000 years of probation to deal with the sin issue on earth. And we've come to the end of that time. 
time has run out on planet Earth. It is time now for God to act. So the clock has run out, and God will now bring the great controversy between the between God and the devil to a rapid conclusion in 1,335 days. Right here, we're right at the end of time. And how will God bring this to a conclusion? Well, his seven seals on the book of life, one by one, will be opened. God will use the seven trumpet judgments to be redemptive in terms of drawing people towards him during the great tribulation and he will use the seven last plagues as punitive judgment to those that sin against his saints during the final days so God has carefully planned out the 1335 days of the great tribulation to both expose the evil ways of the devil and at the same time save as many souls on earth as possible. That's what the Great Tribulation is about, is, it, is the uh, working out of these seals, trumpets, and plagues. All right, so let's see what the Bible has to say about God's wrath. God's wrath can be directed at an individual or a nation, and it's been directed in both places over the years. God's love is going, you'll see, is revealed as a perfect balance between justice and mercy. Because of sin, man's sense of balance between justice and mercy has become distorted and inadequate. And we cannot see everything as God sees it. And our limited view makes it our, makes the, us redo. God's love is revealed in perfect balance between justice and mercy. Because of sin, man's sense of balance between justice and mercy has become distorted and inadequate. We cannot see everything that God sees, obviously, and our limited view makes trusting an infinite God very hard sometimes. We don't see the end from the beginning. So God understands our limitations, but he requires his children to trust him implicitly. He alone knows the best way through the corridors of life to eternity. His laws reflect his infinite knowledge. During the time of the 1335 days of God's wrath, many people will learn what divine love is all about and for the first time experience a saving relationship with God. And you can read about this in Jeremiah 29. So stunned by the chaos and destruction, people will open their Bibles and discover a diary of God's actions covering thousands of years. We will study this topic from our Bible. They will discover what? They will discover that God's policies are changeless because God does not change. So let's get into the full cup principle. The Bible says that God is love. Find that in 1 John 4, 8, amongst other places. And the Bible also says that God has wrath. Colossians 3, 5, and 6. You can read that. So because God's character has both properties, it is sometimes difficult for us to reconcile these two attitudes, attributes. 
God's character has both properties, so it's difficult for us to reconcile these attributes. So let's consider how the perfect balance works between God's love and God's wrath. Bible history reveals that God follows a consistent principle when dealing with humanity. This is called the full cup principle because the Bible often uses the metaphor of a cup to indicate the fullness of an experience. The fullness of an experience. For example, consider the words of Jesus just before he was arrested and crucified. He said, My Father, if it be possible, may this bitter cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So the, the, the cup in this case was a bitter cup that Jesus was talking to his father about asking if it's possible for this cup to, to not to be taken from him. So Jesus did not want to endure the experience of a bitter death on the cross. But he was willing to do it if this was the only way to save human, the human race. The metaphor of a cup can be used to indicate a joyful experience also. Consider David's well-known words. You prepared a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup of joy overflows. That's in Psalms 23.5. So this was a joyful, positive experience. King David uses the metaphor of an overflowing cup to express the joy beyond containment. From these examples, we see that a cup represents an experience. The contents of the cup indicate the type of experience. Notice how God uses use the metaphor of the cup in Jeremiah's day. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, has, to, has said to me. Take from my hand this cup, fill to the brim with the wine of my wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom he sent me drink it. Jeremiah 25. Now compare Jeremiah's words with the warning words of God's servants, the 144,000 in Revelation 14. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. So God's cup of his wrath or the cup, the cup will be poured out on those that worship the beast or his image and, and receive the mark of the beast. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. That's Revelation 14, verse 9. So this text points forward to a time during the Great Tribulation when people will be warned about worshiping the Antichrist. Everyone who submits to the laws of the devil will have to drink from the cup of God's wrath. It's in Revelation 14.
So the full cup principle is based on the idea that God measures, God measures the actions of mankind. When God forces people to reap what they have sown, he is returning to them what they deserve. Galatians 6, you can read about that. So this is the golden rule. The golden rule is an iron clad rule, it says. As we do unto others, the same will be done to us. That's in Matthew 7 and Obaniah Ob uh, 1. Because God acts on this principle, he is said to have vengeance. That's in Romans 12 and Revelation 2. So in a similar way, God measures the actions of nations. So we looked about at some individuals here reading, getting the mark of the beast. Let's look at some nations now. Do you remember the words of Daniel when he spoke to King Belshazzar the night he saw the handwriting on the wall? David said, this is what these words on the wall mean. Mia, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tikal, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Prius, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That's found in Daniel 5. So God measured measures the actions of nations. He keeps track of things. So Babylon had filled its cup and God responded. God's patience with man's arrogance and defiance definitely has limits. When you fill the cup, God acts. When the cup of transgressions is nearly full, God breaks his silence by sending a warning through his selected messengers. So if the warning does not work, he then uses one or more of his four deadly judgments, sword, famine, plagues, and wild beast. Ezekiel 14 or Revelation 6, you can read about these. So when his warnings don't work, he sends his four deadly judgments. So if the situation is redeemable, the judgments are redemptive. If the situation is not redeemable, the judgments are destructive. So the Great Tribulation will be divided into two groups of seven, seven things. The first seven plagues, seven trumpets, if you will, will be redemptive. People, God is trying to save as many people during the first seven plagues as possible. The last seven plagues, or the seven bowls, as it's called, will be totally destructive. First seven are redemptive, last seven are destructive. So many people currently interpret God's silence or passiveness with evil to mean that he is either non-existent, God doesn't exist, or he's indifferent on what we do. Others see his permissiveness as proof that he is not interested in each person's day-to-day -day activities. For this reason, a growing number of people are committing terrible crimes and evil deeds, thinking that God does not see them and will not hold them responsible for their actions. And many people do not realize that strict accountability that each of us must give to God for every action. God is going to hold everyone 
accountable for every action they do. Solomon said, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Ecclesiastes 12. So God holds mankind, holds each one of us accountable for every deed and every hidden thing. The Amorites had not yet filled their cup. This is a case where we find where God is measuring their cup. Then the Lord said to him, Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in the country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your father's peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Genesis 15. So God was measuring the sins of a nation here. It's an example of that. But they had not yet reached their full measure. So this is an example where we see that God has measured the cup, but it has not yet reached its full measure. The nation of Israel filled its couplets with sin. Just before the Babylonian captivity, God told Israel, but you did not listen to me, and you have provoked me with, your hand, with, with what your hands have made, and you have brought harm to yourselves. Because you have not listened to my words, I will summons all the people of the north and my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So in this case, even an evil nation, God is using an evil nation. He's calling that evil nation my servant, king of Babylon. And I will bring them against this land, against Israel, and its inhabitants, and against all the surrounding nations. The nation of Israel filled its cup with sin. I will completely destroy them, Israel, and make them an object of horror and scorn and everlasting ruin. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation and the land of the Babylonians for their guilt and I will make it desolate forever. That's in Jeremiah 25. It says, I will completely destroy them, Israel, and make them an object of horror and scorn in an everlasting ruin. God's cup was full. So even in the New Testament, we have examples of this. The New Testament principle of the, in the New Testament, the, the full cup principle is confirmed here. Paul warned that sexual immorality of the Romans, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgments, judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. But for those who are self-seeking, or who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. That's in Romans 2. There will be wrath. There will be God's wrath. So 
So look at these verses in the New Testament. For we, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For we must all, not some, not just the evil ones, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, while on earth, whether good or bad. So if you do good deeds, God will reward those. If you do bad things, God will mete out his justice. Paul understood why God's wrath is coming. Put to death your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Colossians 3. So Jesus and the full cup, after pronouncing seven curses on the Jewish leaders for their religious bigotry and hypocrisy, Jesus said, Fill up, then, the measure of the cup of your sin of your forefathers, you snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Matthew 23. When a nation or an individual reaches the limit of divine forbearance, God breaks his silence and his, his mercy, with, mercy with sin and sinners has a limit. It does not go on forever and ever. So Jesus in the full cup. Jesus predicted that uh, predicted Jerusalem's destruction as a fulfillment of God's wrath. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judah flee to the mountains, and let those in the city get out, and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment, of wrath, in fulfillment of all that has been written concerning Israel. This is in Luke 21. So the question is, does God kill people? From time to time, scholars, pastors have asserted that God does not kill or destroy people. They defend this by saying that, number one, God does not violate his own commandment, thou shalt not kill. Or, God just steps aside and turns evil people over to their na the natural consequences of sin, which brings death and destruction. In simple terms, advocates of this view reason that if God is love, he does not violate his character of love by doing evil, that is, killing. It's in 1 John 4. You can study that. So God either allows sin to take its natural destructive course, or he turns them over to the devil, allowing Satan to do whatever he wishes. Well, the justification used to support either of these positions is false. The Bible puts God in an active role, an active role, not a passive role, concerning destruction on earth at the time of the flood. Let's look at this. Notice the same position of God's wrath with respect to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from, from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation on the land. So the Lord rained down burning sulfur. He burned up Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities in that area, in the entire plain. He burned the cities down, all the living people, 
All the people in the cities were killed. Even the vegetation was burned up. It's in Genesis 13. And also Genesis 19. So then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. This is very personal. It says the Lord did this. He was the active agent in doing this. Centuries later, in Jude, the New Testament, Jude warned about or warned the early Christians, saying, in a similar way as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns were given themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion, they serve as an example of those who will suffer the punishment of eternal fire that will come down from God out of heaven. So Jude used Sodom and Gomorrah as an example of what will happen to those who are sinning in the New Testament era. The Lord said to Israel at the same time of, of giving the covenant at Mount Sinai, if in spite of these things, redemptive judgments, you do not accept my correction, but continue to be hostile towards me, I myself will be hostile towards you, and I will afflict you for your sins seven times over. So here God is trying to correct their actions, but they did not want to accept the corrective actions. So he will afflict them because of their sins seven times over. And I will bring the sword upon you to avenge the breaking of the covenant. And when you withdraw into your cities, I will send a plague among you, and you will be given into the enemy's hands. Leviticus 26. There are many more examples in the Bible, but these should be sufficient to show that God not only kills people for justifiable reasons, but he takes full responsibility for doing so. So God's wrath is going to be revealed in our day. Listen to this. I, the Lord, have spoken. The time has come for me to act. I will not hold back. I will not have pity, nor will I relent. You will be judged according to your conduct and your actions, declares the Sovereign Lord. That's Ezekiel 24. So when the Lord spoke these words to, to Ezekiel, he was referring to the fact that Israel had filled its cup. So let's look at the people in Noah's day, how their cup was filled. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become, and that every inclination that means every thought, day and night, 24-7, every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds for the air. For I am grieved that I have made them. Genesis 6. He said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. God's cup was full. Man's cup was full at this time, mankind. So God destroyed the world with the flood in Noah's day when their cup of iniquity had reached full measure. God broke his silence 
through Noah by warning the world about his forthcoming actions. Then when 120 years had expired, he warned them for 120 years. So when the 120 years had expired, he destroyed all but eight of the inhabitants of the world. So when extended mercy fails to produce the repentance and reformation, as in Noah's day, God's justice demands destructive action. I want you to consider this, Noah's day. When God caused the global flood, only eight people were spared the wrath of God, only eight people. Now there's various estimates of the number of people that were alive, but some people estimate it in the millions of souls that were alive on the earth at this time, and they all perished. They all died in the flood waters, except for eight people. God did everything he could to warn earth and save as many as would accept his warnings. Noah preached for 120 years. Now what does the Bible say in Matthew? But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, we will have on earth the same conditions as in Noah's day, just before the coming of God. And what happened during Noah's time? Eight people were saved. Millions of souls were lost. The same thing is going to happen during the Great Tribulation, except instead of millions, it will be billions. God's wrath will be revealed soon. Our day is coming too. God will break his silence and demonstrate his animosity towards sin. It will happen suddenly, very suddenly. Life as we know it will immediately and irrevocably change. The world has never witnessed anything like the coming judgments of God. God will act suddenly and powerfully and all the inhabitants of earth will be overwhelmed with his swiftness and intensity. The authority and the character and actions of God will be the subject of intense and controversial study among everyone on earth during the 1335 days. Why would God do this? It says in Revelation 14, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. This is what will happen. This angel will give this message during the Great Tribulation. And he's going to give it to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. When they see this carnage all around, they will know that the hour of his judgment has come. They will see it. And this admonition here will be to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So, I believe we're over here at the end of time, end of the 6,000 years. Time has run out for us on earth. The seals are opening, the seven trumpets will be soon released and the seven last plagues will fall after that. God will use the trumpet judgments to save as many souls on earth as are willing to agree to his terms. God has terms. And these trumpet judgments will be a tool for God to use to save as many people as possible. So you remember this chart we started off with? When the censer is cast down, we will know that the trumpets are about to be released. 
and God's cup, man's cup is full, earth's cup is full, and the, and the censer will be cast down. You know, there are two sanctuaries. I want to just cover this real quickly with you. There are two sanctuaries. There's the heavenly sanctuary, and there's the earthly sanctuary. Now, the earthly sanctuary was called a copy of the real thing. It's also called a shadow of the real thing. So the real thing is in heaven, and the earthly tabernacle, the earthly sanctuary, uh, represented what goes on in the sanctuary in heaven. So in the heavenly sanctuary now, Jesus will cast down onto the earth the censer, indicating that corporate mercy has ended. So on the earthly uh, tabernacle in the desert, had several pieces here that we're just going to quickly look at here. There was the daily service on the altar of burnt offering that occurred in, the, occurred in the courtyard here. This is where the individual sins were, uh, the animals were sacrificed for our individual sins. In the tent of meeting, there's the altar of incense. And at the altar of incense in the morning and in the evening, there was a uh, service for corporate sins of the Jewish nation at large. Two services, one for individual sins and one for corporate sins. So when the censer from the altar of incense is cast down, so they'll take coal, the, the angel will take coals from this altar and it will be cast down onto the earth. And that will indicate that corporate mercy, this service, has ended. The corporate mercy for the earth has ended. So when the fire of the altar is cast onto the earth, God's intervention for corporate earth has ended in the temple's heaven, temple of heaven. God's cup is full. Corporate grace for the planet Earth has ended. God's wrath will now be released on planet Earth. There, there still will be individual salvation and grace available until the start of the last seven plagues. So during this time, individuals can be saved, but corporate-wise, Earth will start receiving the wrath of God. The Great Tribulation will last for 1,335 days, and that's just prior to Jesus' second coming. The trumpet judgments will kill billions of people. So the question is, will everyone who perishes during the 1,335 days of the Great Tribulation be lost? Are these lost people? And the question is no. Or the answer is no. Let's look at Revelation 15, 13. Then I heard a voice in heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, that is, during the Great Tribulation. Another text in Revelation 7. Then one of the elders answered said to me, those who are those arranged in white robes and where did they come from and the answer given to him sir you know these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation so we can see from these three different uh two different texts there that people will die saints will die during the great tribulation so not, not everyone that dies during the, the, uh, the initial first four trumpet judgments will be the lost. There will be many saints lost during this period. And they will be uh, saved into God's kingdom. It says they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So these are saved individuals. 
Yes, God's wrath is coming soon, and it will be released on this planet Earth. And my appeal to you is found in the Bible. It's found in Isaiah 55. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So my prayer and my hope for you is that you will seek the Lord now while he can be found. He will abundantly pardon each and every one of our sins if we ask him to. God, have, God has promised better days ahead for us. We see in 1 Corinthians 2, there's a great promise. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the hearts of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So even though we go through the great tribulation, we may be martyrs, we may be killed during this time, there's better days ahead for us. And God says that we can't even imagine the good things that are ahead for us that God has planned for us. So this is a hope that we can cling to. So let me give you a little conclusion of this whole study. Timing. I don't know when the day, don't, I don't know the day when the sensor will be cast down. I just don't know it. But I believe the day is nearing. The good news is that once the sensor is cast down, we are 1,335 days from the second coming of Jesus. Number two, God's wrath, as manifested by the trumpet judgments, will shake the faith of many Christians. The concept of God's wrath falling on both the evil and the saints is not taught or understood by many Christians. This is pretty much soft peddled in, in churches. And number three, many Christians will be martyred during the Great Tribulation, but God will give his grace for the day. He will give us grace to endure this martyrdom. So I hope you've gained a blessing from these studies. They are a bit difficult to give, but I hope you've gained a blessing. And if you have any questions on these studies, you can uh, send an email to me at this uh, email address, comments at thecomingcrisis.org. And if you've received a blessing from today's study, why not tell your friends about it and let them view these podcasts for themselves? Here are all the Bible texts that we used in today's study. You can uh, stop this video now and copy these down if you want. Study those for yourself. Again, I want to thank you for taking time to view this video, and we pray that it's been a blessing to, to you. Thanks. Remember now that God loves you.